Hi, I'm Mark Cleveland and welcome to my Posing and Lighting the Bride and Groom. In this film, we're going to be looking specifically at how we animate and how we light for the best kind of impact within a photograph. Uh, we're going to be using uh, images taken from one of my workshops because workshops are great because obviously we get to do a little bit more in a workshop day with a model bride and groom than we would actually on a real wedding. However, check out one of my other films where we'll be looking at a real wedding and how these kind of same techniques were applied in the real world. So the key point to this is we're looking at animation, we're going to be looking at direction of light, we're going to be looking at composition as well, kind of going throughout, and we're going to be looking at how to really bring some variety to the everyday wedding photography. And even though this is done, as I said, on a workshop, the key point is that you can take a little bit of this and apply it to an everyday wedding. You'll never be able to achieve everything that we can do on a workshop on a real wedding day, but you can achieve at least 20 to 25% of what we've got in here. And that's, as I said, why I've got one of the other films on a real wedding to kind of demonstrate what those sections are and how we've kind of pulled all that together. So what we're gonna be seeing is basically at times side-by-side -side images, four on a page at times, and a kind of a little bit of a title. So at least you can get used to that to begin with. Um, looking for the light is absolutely key. Uh, why is it key? Well, when I first work or kind of go to a location, uh, the most important thing for me, I know for many of you, it's the background itself, um, but I'm looking for the direction of the light and then a complement with the background. So for instance, if I've got a great background, but the light is rubbish, as long as I accept the light is rubbish, I can use the background. If I try and do a classical kind of photography, where, now what, what I mean by that is in the lighting quality, um, and I try and use that background when I'm going to get rubbish. So that's the kind of the benefit that I've got to understand for myself exactly what I can achieve in this location and what I can't achieve. If I've got a great location as far as the lighting is concerned, but the background isn't very good, then the only thing I need to do is kind of not show much of the background. So again, if the background is bad, I'd show less of the background, but make use of the best lighting. If the background is great, but the lighting is bad, then I need to make use of the couple, not looking at camera position and just making use of whatever I can, and then move on to a secondary location to be able to use it. Now, um, basically, this is a phenomenal background. It's an old kind of castle uh, keep, and uh, we've got great direction of light to here as you kind of look around the quality of the lighting on towards the face. And even though she's looking away here, we can see what I've done is light the five planes of the face. Very, very classical, but we've got a classical look, a classical background. That's where they all kind of merge together. And the reason I'm able to shoot, to shoot this is, in fact, what we can't see here, there's an overhang. Um, it's basically an overhang of the kind of the archway that subtracts the overhead light. One of the biggest that troubles that we have when we're in open light is that the light will come obviously straight down, will create dark shadows underneath the eyes and give no little um, direction to the light itself. Because of the subtraction of the light here, and because I've got it just on the edge of the lighting, uh, what I'm able to do is make use of the light coming in from behind and from above to create this gorgeous, kind of classical use of the light, the lighting going through it. But what I mustn't do here is get her to look towards camera position. As soon as she looks towards camera position, just as she is, I've basically got rubbish. Why? Because there's, no going to be, there's not gonna be any good quality of lighting on the face uh, and hence rubbish. We may as well throw it away. The bride and groom are just gonna complain perhaps because the bride's gonna look dark and so on. Yes, we can use reflectors. Yes, we can use flash. But the trouble is then when we get with a reflector, we've got to work in closer perhaps. Or when we're using flash, we're gonna illuminate some of the kind of the details that we don't want to unless we're going off to uh, using off camera flash, of course. Now that same direction of light here that we, we can see, basically if I move the camera position around, so where she's looking to, I've moved the camera position around, so around about a 90 degree kind of position move around in a clockwise direction. Um, what happens then is she looks towards the light, and as we can see here, when she starts to look towards the light, the lighting becomes flat. And we've got to remember a saying that says <laughs> that the flat light is fat light. And as soon as you get that into your head, you start to want to choose more of a directional light. Once we start to accept a directional light is slimming and more complementary to the subject, we're going to start to look for locations that really allow us to benefit from that light, uh, the lighting. Yes, it's beautiful. It's simple. We've got a very slim kind of model here. Um, however, what we want to make sure that we're doing is using, as I said, that complementary the light, uh, the lighting. However, on a wet day, which this is in fact, um, I've got a great location here.
here, I've got a nice variety of photographs. I can walk outside, I can get a little bit wet, and I've still got some lovely kind of nice and bright light images. But we've got to be aware as well is that when the light starts to light onto the front of them, i.e. this flat light, uh, the flat light in, what's going to happen in the background, it's often going to go dark, unless, of course, there's a, some secondary light coming in through the gate or the grills or whatever it would be. So you've got to watch that things don't become too dark when you start to use flat lighting. It's a bit like having flash on camera and just throw in all the light at the, sub at the subject and hence you're going to have a little bit of shadow behind them. But again, as the light drops off, it starts to get darker. So let's talk a little bit about variety in the pose. Um, and to begin with, I'm not going to talk about too much variety in the pose. What I'm going to talk about initially is the camera distance. If you're using a zoom lens, great, because we can get kind of closer in and in um, just with the zoom itself. But I'll always encourage you to use the longest length of the lens first. So in other words, if I'm using a 24 to 105 zoom uh, with this kind of bride and groom photography, I'm going to want to be on the 105 length. So I'm walking further away and then walk in towards the couple to kind of get the closer and closer images as I'm coming in. Why? Well, it's going to allow my background to drop out of focus much, much quicker than it would be if I allowed the 24 lens. In other words, I zoom backwards to show more of the scene like we are here. And the, on, the only way on the likes of a 24 to 105 lens uh, to be able to kind of drop out the groom as much in focus as we are here is if we are using the full 105 extension zoom of the lens itself. Um, otherwise, it's going to give too much detail. So for me, the key thing is, OK, if I get the pose right initially for full length, I can then move closer and closer all, all the time. And all I need to do is either a slight little movement of the hand, a slight different facial position, will give me a different variety of photographs each time. So what, what, what I'm not looking to do is keep that absolute same pose static. Look here, it's not much of a difference between this image and the next image. They're both full for length. One is showing the scene, and these are images straight out of camera, by the way. In the post-production finishing, I'd be adding a little bit of vignetting towards these images and catch the uh, other film in this series dedicated just to the post-production finishing. Uh, but for here, we would be uh, adding the vignette around the image to darken, to kind of control the eye in towards the position here. So even though it's not a huge difference, what you can see is I've animated the groom. So he's looking away at this stage, which is just not the same shot. I always like to change one little element within the photograph. If you imagine you're an animator and you're kind of just moving a wrist or a hand and you're doing a kind of a, car a cartoon, that's pretty much what I want to do in the likes of animation, the basic animation to give me that simple variety of the posing. When we go to great locations like we are here, uh, we're right on the edge of the kind of the gate. There's no subtraction of light going on here. Uh, you can see in the background is where we began with that first photograph of the bride and so on. Um, but here she's walking in towards the shot, a little bit of play, a little bit of laugh, uh, laughter. Harder to do, in fact, on a workshop when the couple are not real than you are when you're working on a real wedding day, then there's that great atmosphere going on with the bride and groom, that kind of anticipation. And as long as I build up the buzz and the kind of the character, that I can really get real expressions coming through instead of models where you hope they're going to at least fake it on the day. So as far as the kind of the basics, the kind of just using the locations key, show it. One of the biggest mistakes that I see with photography is that photographers, especially when they're using very long lenses, most of the day is in a close-up, a tight kind of style of photography. If you're going to go to amazing locations like, like this, at least step back for a couple of dozen images to show that location and how beautiful it is and the scenery and so on with it. Because there could, there could be the chance, and probably most of the time for me, that it's only myself and the bride and groom who are visiting this location. The parents, the bridesmaids, perhaps the guests are, are not even going to be visiting this location with us at all. So it's good in the storytelling element to remember to show the variety. But just e even through here, as I said, the talk and the walk, kind of get them to talk to each other coming through and then finally finishing off with a kind of a couple just having a little bit of kind of a natural cuddle and a kiss, perhaps. Composition is absolutely key not just key to the kind of the classic world of art, but also in photography. And if we can educate ourselves into natural composition, so in other words, without even th thinking, you're placing the subjects in a dynamic position within the photograph. Now, again, I like to kind of break rules, but on the other hand, it's good to know rules so you can break them as such, really. But if we look at the kind of the classic third elements that we're going in here, so in other words, if we dissect the image into nine kind of rectangle shapes, so two kind of vertical stripes, two horizontal stripes. 
The next thing what we've got, we can see where the point of in, uh, the interest is, and that's on the intersection of one of those lines of thirds. Um, so that was a very, very strong kind of use of composition here. And so is this image as well. If we could d dissect it once more, okay, we're not going to get the perfect kind of com the composition, but if we dissect it once into thirds, they are very, very close. Their heads are again into that golden kind of mean with it. But look how the kind of cam the camera angle choice, the position where I am, is allowing the eye to lead us uh, straight to the bride and groom. And I've got a dark, er a dark area of the photograph here because it's being subtracted with the light, of course. And because they're the lightest point within the photograph, it naturally leads the eye straight, straight to them, giving us a much more kind of di a dynamic image and kind of a more of an interesting image as well. And, a, you know, if you allow space around an image, there's a good chance you're going to end up selling bigger wall portraits, of course. Uh, if you just kind of keep everything tight, everything's basically you know, image for the piano or the desktop and things really, instead of actually looking for kind of wall art. Variety without moving. <laughs> well, that's exactly it. I'm a lazy devil. And if you can get away with variety without having to do a lot, uh, the kind of the key, uh, the key thing is to just think about a simple step to one side. So a kind of one step or two, two steps, instead of having dramatically change your location here. Uh, we've got a kind of a nice, simple kind of duo of images, one at camera, the camera position, then one with a groom looking towards her. I've only had to move the camera position ever so slightly here, one step to my left, and I've changed my background. So I've gone from this dark kind of wall to now the kind of all the grass in the background. In fact, it's a road in the background that you can see here. Um, but again, by using a very long lens, like a 7200 lens here, running at f2.8, f4, full extension of the zoom, you're gonna drop the background out and so on. But this just give, gives us a nice little flow without having to work hard, which is always key because as a wedding photographer, time is never on our side and we've got to make maximum use of the time that we've allocated by the bride and groom. And if we're traveling to a location like, like this, I don't want to spend too long kind of doing all the fussiness, get it right to begin with, do a flow of images, change a little bit, make sure the dress is right again, then do another flow of images. So you've always got that repetition going through it and it'll add you a nice variety. Uh, what I've done here, I've reversed the angle. Um, so instead of kind of photographing towards, we're back into this flat light position. And now we've got this kind of flat light, which means there's no separation with the hair. If we just go back and compare it to some of the other images here, we have this light coming through in the background, which gives us this natural separation coming down the side of the body. Whereas in this image, well, what we have is the flatness of the light coming in towards here, and there's nothing coming up the corridor. And because there's nothing coming up the corridor, we get this lower key kind of background, as I explained right at the beginning. But the key thing is, to begin with, we've got two different sets of photographs here. One with the light, one against the light, and that will allow us to actually get that variety again in a minimum amount of time. When we start to do the portrait of the bride and groom and we start to ask them to look off camera, you know, can you just look towards that tree, can you look to, over to my right, look over to my left, whatever it be, um, often is the case they'll look with their eyes and not with the head first. Uh, we've got to kind of try and keep the eyes in the same line as the nose itself. And one of the problems, if we just look into this image here, we can see she's done exactly that, in fact. She's looked off towards the right-hand side, as I've asked her to do, without any movement of the head. And the, prob the problem with that, there's too much kind of white of the eye nearest to, cam to camera position, and it just looks strained. And when an image starts to look strained, it kind of has this kind of pain element beginning to actually show, show through. But just with a simple ro rotation of the head around, there's the kind of the portrait looks a lot more relaxed, allowing it to kind of flow from face to camera, and then obviously with the looking away. Two different styles of shot with no work at all, just getting the client to look in the direction, but controlling their eye viewpoint as well. Let's not forget getting closer to the subject, of course. And uh, just by using the zoom lens, you know, we can drastically change our impact with the image. But remember your feet. Your feet will zoom as well as your lens. And as I said kind of a couple of times during this film already, I want to use that lens at the maximum length as I can. So if it was a 70 to 200 lens, I want to try and use it towards the 200 length. If I've got a 24 to 105 zoom, I want to use it at the 105. And this gets that lovely kind of drop off in focus in the background, but it's also more complementary to the, sub the subject. Um, here again, just a vertical, don't forget the horizontal as well. I know it might be very strange for you to cut through foreheads and so on, always do a variety. I wouldn't just do this shot, I would also have another shot where we've got basically the full head. So obviously the client can't complain at that point. So it's key 
that we've got a shot with and without the kind of the crop. But getting into those eyes, that's really what it's about. This fantastic expression. Remember, a slight tilt on the, uh, the camera position as well will kind of give you a bit of a Dutch tilt, it's called, to bring you even more and add extra interest to the photograph. We always want to be shooting the back of the dress as well. So once we've kind of posed up and we've got the one shot, um, probably I'm going to go in and do a three-quarter length as well at that stage, but I always want to remember the twist. The twist will bring an extra elegance and angularity to the pose, which will just add that extra kind of edge to the photograph, plus it will give you a little bit more variety as well, which is obviously key when time is not on our side. And then when we've done the twist, we can kind of get in closer to maximise that variety, slight different animation, again looking away as one here, looking back towards cam uh, camera, then a complete change with the arm kind of change going towards here, a shift into the hip to add that extra little bit of animation in towards the pose and kind of just controlling the expression back towards cam uh, the camera. But it's also worth to note here, let's not forget that we're talking about uh, the complementary elements. We've got kind of light coming onto our, sub our subject here, but that light is coming through now because we're in the subtraction um, and we're kind of in a dark area. The light coming in from behind is going to add a lovely separation to her. We can see that specifically running on the side of the hair and running down the side of the dress as well. We'll add that extra three-dimensional kind of separation to any of our images. So again, when working against the light, uh, use a reflector if you're in three-quarter length. Obviously, when you're in full length, you're going to be too close up to actually add a reflector in. Uh, the split subject is a popular thing that I like to do. Uh, I do have some clients when they look through the kind of the books beforehand, so they kind of chat around about six weeks before the wedding day. Uh, that's when I kind of go through a couple of weddings in a similar time of year as theirs. And uh, again, some of them will say, well, I don't really like this kind of style and so on. I'll probably still throw one in <laughs> just because he's in the background or I'm going to get him to walk in towards me. And I'd much prefer to shoot, shoot it than not shoot it. Uh, and again, if you can get the kind of groom walk, uh, walking to, uh, towards us, the closer he comes, of course, he's going to get sharper and sharper. And that works in reverse. So if he starts with her and then he walks away from us, of course, he's going to get uh, uh, kind of unsharp as he's going away. So a lovely series of images. Um, and, but just in here, when I'm looking at page layout on, in my head on a wedding day, I'm thinking, how will this flow? Is this two or three shots? And I promise you, once you get into this kind of flow of ideas of what to shoot during the course of a wedding day, you're not playing safe, you're allowing yourselves enough variety without having to shoot thousands and thousands of images to get a great collection for the bride and groom. I'm probably going to you know, shoot on a wedding day around about 1,100 images. That would include the first dance. Um, and I'll probably edit that down to around about the 600 to 700 images tops. If it was a wedding without the first dance and without the spe uh, speeches, I'm probably going to shoot about 600 images and kind of narrow that down to about 400. 400. But you know, when you're photographing bride and groom, there's only so much that you can do in one location. So without having to move in a drastic kind of way, we can still add variety and a split subject is a quick way to be able to do that. Key things are, again, aperture control and long length of the lens. I talked about flat is fat before, uh, in other words, the lighting coming on towards the face. Um, we've moved her right onto the edge of the archway like we saw in one of the other photographs, which means pretty much the lighting is coming directly onto her. What I've done though is add a reflector just into the, fore uh, the foreground. You might just be able to see that nick of the edge of the reflector there, which is bouncing a little bit of the lighting up. That's just kind of give an extra glow to the face and help to fill in the kind of dark edges that you might actually see within the eyes because the light is coming from above a little bit more now. But it gives me this pop, this real kind of wow. And again, another technique with a reflector in place is that instead of just hold, uh, holding it there, is you ask the assistant, as long as they're you know, just a couple of inches away from the bride, they can kind of do a real flutter. So in other words, um, as long as they know the position where the reflector is going to be going back to, they can give a real waft with the reflector. That's going to kind of billow the hair a little bit. And it's a great way to add that extra little di uh, dimension to the photograph, uh, as long as the reflector is put back into the same place. When we're using reflectors, though, we've got to remember to take an exposure from the face with the reflector in place. Otherwise, of course, you could have a very overexposed image, especially if you pop in pure sunlight going on towards the face with a reflector. So again, even though flat is fat, 
when you've got a great look in bride, what you want to do is to make sure you twist the body away a little bit instead of kind of full on and, and flat where the hips are directional on towards camera position. We need to kind of move the hips away a little bit to reduce the body size down in a natural way because obviously when you twist the hips, you're going to reduce the, sub, the subject down by probably about 20% and that's going to be visual uh, as far as we, we can see that in the image itself. But don't forget the expression and don't forget that technique I've shown you about billowing the reflector just to add a, a little bit of wind to billow the hair. Um, I mentioned the word animate before and I truly mean that when we work with posing. Just think like an animator and if we had a little one of those uh, kind of wooden men with the, art, the artist use and you can kind of move their legs and arms and hands and so on. Um, that's exactly what we do really if you think about it with uh, the likes of bride and grooms. You're just going to move one hand to another place. There's times that you put it there and you look back and you go why have I done that? I've done that? That's a classic here. I love the uh, kind of the bride kind of a little casual kind of arm on the hip. And then the, the kind of the hand coming in the background is the problem, in fact, because it's being touched by light and I can see it uh, because of the fleshiness, reflectiveness, um, it kind of adds a distraction to it. And all I need, I need to do here was just add that hand just on towards the edge of the shoulder. Of the shoulder. I could have even moved her away just a fraction more to still allow her to move away with the top part of the body away from the groom, uh, but still move her hips in towards him. Um, and here I've just got the kind of the model couple to kind of uh, for her just to give herself a natural kind of balance and the hand technique around the uh, shoulders is a good a good one linking them together a little bit so she feels safe this is pretty much a lead on to the next pose in fact where we would get his hand out of his pocket bring it back onto her waist and then kind of do a little bit more animation between the two of them. If I left his hand here as I dip her back, then it kind of looks like he couldn't be bothered. And that's a kind of a key thing, is to remember the believability of the animation. And if, if ever you get the chance to watch ballroom dancers, uh, look at how they kind of control their stance and their kind of position. And, and even though it's over animated, it's a good way to learn how the kind of the basics of the structure of the pose work with it. So again, bring some life and bring some animation have a bit of fun but may uh, make sure it looks a little bit relaxed and if you're kind of fussing the pose a bit too uh, too much you're probably going to lose the expression which can be a, ba a bad thing and some couples on their wedding day they might be a little bit tense or nervous about the photography and you might lose that kind of real character in their face because you're fussing around with them know when to stop is the key point so just as a development from that pose, again, the face position is key and the looking. Look at how we've kind of developed it all, all the way through four different types of photograph. Uh, even though she's looking at me in this same image here, just that cropping in has changed it. Um, but uh, here with her look, looking away, getting the expression, kind of get it real. Um, but uh, as I said, don't forget this hand in the pocket. Just because you put it there doesn't mean it can't come on towards her hip at times, not through all the photographs because that hand of his can look like a domination and it can be a distraction within, in the photograph. And I often talk about distraction or attraction. If something's in the photograph and it doesn't look quite, uh, quite right, it's probably distracting you. So learn to minimize what a hand or a limb is doing with it in the pose. Don't forget to move the camera position in that exact same flow as we just did. Just a, a simple couple of paces to the right or to the left will dramatically change your image. And that's the kind of results that you can get, the, get there. Still looking uh, again the bride, looking at me, looking at each other, looking away, just to actually add that extra flow in a very, very quick time. Because if I can obtain the kind of the core images within the first five to six minutes of the photography of the bride and groom, the basics, then it means it gives me so much more time to have a little bit more fun, have a little bit more play, and kind of allow the, the more of the, dra the drama through, through technique or through animation to kind of start its time. If we're spending all the 15 or 20 minutes that we have kind of in, in UK to spend with our bride and grooms, just doing the basics with us, it doesn't leave us any room to add that edge of creativity to the photograph, which is a real shame because again, at the couple, if they've been seeing the variety of your work and your, al your albums and so on, really what they want to do is have that bit from that wedding and that bit from that wedding and that bit from another wedding. And they want all those mixed together on theirs, but being realistic, remember, this is a wet location at this time it is raining outside and that's absolutely key for us not to forget even though it looks like there's a lot of uh, light coming in through the background here it's because they're in that subtracted light and there's so much light coming through even, even though it's spitting with rain i did say about the rain didn't i <laughs> classic here but uh, again i've had brides come out of church hitch up their dress and run to the car and you go was I ready for that? It was a good job I was, um, because otherwise you've missed it all. And it's a good idea if we get to know about these things, but I guarantee you on one wedding day, you're going to get that and you're going to think, 
Why was I messing around? Why was I fussing? Why was I not prepared? Okay, with this kind of couple, I know it's a model bride and groom, but I'm, ki I'm not kidding you. I would care them playing around with the, um, the umbrellas. I've had bridesmaids with umbrellas, the best man with umbrellas, all running up and down locations, having a bit of fun, swapping umbrellas, uh, kind of just showing me the umbrella instead of them and kind of doing lots of variety of make play. But when we're just doing the bride and groom here, the walk away and the walk to us, will give us that kind of variety. One of the key, the key things though, unless it's a winter wedding and it's dark, you really don't want to be using any kind of flash uh, on camera coming onto the subject when it rains because the shadow from the rain will actually put itself onto a shadow of the dress kind of thing. So just watch out for that. And, and, and all these photographs that we're showing you today, except for a few which I'll mention about, are all without flash. They're all the natural light, just animating and using the natural light within the scene. When we get into the habit of using the same location time after time after time, we all do it, I promise you. Um, but one of the things I disciplined myself into right from the beginning was even though I wanted to say use these pillars here in a classical way, what else is around me that I haven't used before? Um, I had one weekend, or one week I should say, where I had five weddings of my own all in the same ho hotel. The great thing, the hotel had only been open for about 12 months, so it was all new to me and it was all new to everyone else. But what I did, uh, kind of the first wedding, uh, obviously beforehand, I went and kind of wrecked my locations with it. And on the first wedding, I chose my kind of classic locations, but then I chose my different location to kind of go to, uh, go to my second point within the, ho the hotel itself, where we were doing all the other photographs. And what I did is exactly the same with all the other weddings that I had in that week. I would do the classics, the, the location is great, the, light, the lighting is great, why change it? But then I would choose something different to go and kind of make their... Uh, images, you know, difference we're going through. And what happened then was during the course of the next year, um, I found that I've had about six or seven locations that I could really call upon and kind of just get a different kind of taste and different flavour with it, especially uh, if you have sisters who are getting married and they're kind of a year and a half apart or two years apart or wh whatever. Um, what I don't like to do is repeat exactly the same thing that I did with the other sister, of course. So here, um, the, dif the difference is I've got a great set of pillars. We're going to be seeing those used more now in a minute. But I've got this fantastic glassway. Uh, this is just an office, in fact. And I've got her to kind of lean not on the glass, but just on the support of the glass here. Obviously, it wouldn't be good if she fell through the glass on a wedding day. Um, so kind of just being careful as far as that's concerned. But just two different styles of photographers we'll see. We're going to see the images with the pillar soon. And we're going to see the images with, with the glass. Two totally different locations, but within five feet and a camera turn of each other. So absolutely key to look to the side and look behind you as well to kind of see what else is there for you to use. Hands and arms are probably the most difficult thing when we take away the bouquet from a bride. What do you do with them? Great, a guy's got a pockets in his trou trousers, he can throw his jacket over his shoulder, he can kind of do them crossed. There's lots of things that we can do with that. However, you take away a bouquet from a bride and all of a sudden it's kind of, what do we do with these now? think just like the groom. <laughs> There's things that we could be doing with them. It's just not le uh, leaving them there. And at times, if you just leave them in front, um, what you can end up with, it can look like she's pregnant, in fact. She's almost holding onto her belly. That's the last thing you want to do. But you can get this hand up onto a hip. We can get this hand behind the back. We could get a pinch of a dress. We're going to see all these things coming through the next series of images now. But if in doubt, hide them. That's the lesson of these two images. When we can see the kind of the messiness, the kind of awkwardness that we've got here, um, if you're in doubt, hide, hide them. That's hands and arms, anything really. Um, because once they're out of sight, we can't worry about them at all. Uh, using that glass, uh, again, just choosing my camera angle. So in other words, going flat onto the glass now, it gave, it gave me this reflection uh, of a still that very wet location behind me, in fact. Um, it, same, same day, same couple, just move location on the workshop. Um, but here it's kind of mucky on the glass and so on. And I know it's a lovely location. I want to use it. But without kind of going in and doing a lot of Photoshop work with it, uh, I kind of just need to fix it here on the spot. And a quick trick, as we're doing here, is breathing on the front of the lens. Just that kind of quick breath will give this kind of fogginess and not just looking at camera position, of course, looking away, looking to the side, even going back to the same position, will completely dynamically change the image. So in other words, all I'm doing is kind of focusing, kind of getting ready, and then I'll just turn the camera around, 
breathe on the lens, allow it to evaporate just a little bit, and then start to take the photographs. Uh, you can do that in a set, a set way by using a filter on the front of the lens, and you can spray some hairspray onto the front of the, fil uh, the filter. That will give you a good effect. Uh, a good way as well is to spray the hair, the hair lacquer um, onto a filter. Remember to do it off camera, of course. Um, but kind of put a, a small coin or a piece of card in, in the way when you spray it, and then it's gonna kind of leave a little bit of a clear hole as well, so not everything's gonna to be too pin sharp with it. But use glass, glass is great, reflections is perfect, and it gives that three-dimensional edge as well. And I talked about the classic location. You know what, if I die tomorrow, I know I've shot the hell out of weddings, uh, because where possible, I've looked at, you know, a structure, an environment that will complement the wedding that I'm at. And whether it's the kind of pillars that we've got here, or whether it's a park envir environment, a modern architect location with it, I know that for the majority of my bride and grooms, because let's face it, some bride and grooms don't want to make an effort, they don't want to do these things. Um, but making that effort, looking at the location, understanding how to use that location as well. The great thing about pillars, they're like an open door. In other words, the pillar is the structure of a door frame. It subtracts light, whereas the gap between the two pillars is the opening of the door. If I move her in towards the, uh, the pillar here at the front, we'll start to subtract that light, and the light will react in a different way, of course. Um, but when she's in the light in itself, we can get a very strong contrasty light, even on a dull day. But I can use a softness of this light as well. So instead of her being laying flat onto the pillar, I can move her around towards the side, get her to lean into the feather of the light, and then we start to get a beautiful kind of quality of the light, the light in. But just like as far as the kind of the classic location is concerned, remember, if possible, use a longer lens instead of the wide ag angle element, especially if we're trying to disguise the gaps between the pillars. They, they can be a real kind of night, a nightmare, especially if they're very dark or very light behind. This isn't, this isn't so bad here um, because it is in a very, very similar tonality. However, if that was kind of light coming in from behind, you'd have a white stripe going down there and it would nag the hell out of you every time you looked at that image because it would be a, that distraction, of course. So here, just to change the, cam the camera position, making sure we're using the zoom as well can dramatically change the photograph. I mentioned about the gaps. That's the kind of the classic fix, as you can see here, um, how beautiful that is. And I've probably sold that type of photograph of a bride and groom or a bride more than any other wall print I've ever done. Obviously, that's if I've, I'm at a pillar location, I mean. But this simple kind of composition uh, here where we've got the kind of the lines coming through, they naturally add that composite into the image. And then if we kind of step away for a minute, we start to see, if I don't get the gaps right, we start to see these distractions really going through the image itself. Um, but that's a real powerful, a real dramatic, modern take on a classic location with it. Uh, and it makes it pretty cool for pretty much any bride. We talked about the split uh, of the groom in the background. The same thing applies. That, uh, again, I can use him on a pillar, against a pillar, through a pillar. Um, think quite imaginative at times, even kind of walking toward, uh, towards us. Perhaps just show half the face behind a pillar. Just add that extra variety. So with a classical kind of location that we've got here, uh, it just adds that little bit of uh, more variety in that kind of quick flow for you. Um, some, some would say the background here, this kind of dark blues that everything's painted in the background, uh, is a real distraction within the image. I think the distraction here is, in fact, the top part. And if I could get rid of anything, it would be just the top part here and the top part here, as well as this light just uh, of the pillar running down the side here, because they are distractions within the photograph. But as far as this brown and the kind of the, kind of the colours in the background, um, I don't think they're too distracted within the image. Um, but still, again, it's a great use of splitting the background. We've talked about the reverse direction before when we talked in the archway. Exactly the same thing applies here. Um, this is where the light is coming in towards her. And now she's on the edge of the pillar, as I was saying to you before. So we're using a lovely kind of feather technique. We get a beautiful 45 degree light in just coming through towards here. But then if I spin her around, so in other words, I put her back to where the light is coming from, um, naturally, we're going to increase our exposure. Um, so in other words, what the background is going to then become is much brighter, brighter and the same shot but just from two different angles, 180 difference in, as far as the camera position is concerned, really adds that dramatic difference to the photograph. So even with these slides we're going to be talking about using a reflector, the first thing is how gorgeous is that full length image. 
Uh, again, it's in a classical envi environment, but we know that these are offices here. <laughs> um, so again, just by using that um, f4 of the lens or f2.8 of the lens on a very, very long lens will naturally drop out that background. It just means you've got to walk a bit of a further away, of course. And then, of course, um, what I want to do is just bring an extra little edge to the photograph here. Now, if I'm using an assistant on a wed wedding day, there is no excuse for me not to add more light into the top part of the couple. I'm really looking to light the top torso and the head. There's no excuse for me not to light them with a reflector because they can be off towards the side from outside of the pillars, kicking in the light in towards that position. Um, but the whole point of this part of the demonstration, in fact, was working alone and uh, kind of just looking at how we can kick in the light in towards them. And, and you've pretty much increased that by around about three quarters to a, a stop in expo exposure by adding that reflector in. When you're using reflectors, I do choose the reflector for the day. Most of the time in the, U uh, the UK weather, in winter time, I'm gonna use a silver white. A silver on a dull day to reflect as much light as I can. If I do have some sun uh, sunlight, the white is a reflector. On a summer's day, I use a deflector, which on the one side is basically white, but it's also a diffuser, so it allows the light to pass through it, unlike a white reflector, which bounces the light back. So I lose more of the sunlight as it bounces onto a deflector. It kind of allows it to go through, but it does return some of it. And on the reverse side, there's um, thin strips of silver, and that allows some of the light to be more reflected back in towards the scene. So again, choosing the reflector for the day is absolutely imperative because it can really make a big difference. And what I'm always trying to do with any couple uh, in a scene, I'm trying to create a three-dimensional element. In other words, they naturally jump off the scene. Um, why? Uh, because it just looks much better than kind of flat lighting. And remember, because we've got the lighting coming through the pillars uh, and bouncing some of the light from where I am back on towards them, we get this natural great kind of reflectancy and this extra in impact, bringing the eye straight towards them instead of being distracted around the scene. And remember that simple flow? When I'm up close with the reflector in place, it just means then getting her to look away, the groom to look at her, groom looking at me, gr uh, bride looking at him, and then uh, kind of her, you know, you can make up that as you go along, but it's a lovely little sto a story element to add into your flow, of course. This word animation <laughs> keeps coming up time after time. I think it's a better word than posing. Because when we think about posing somebody, it kind of sounds a little bit kind of fixed and kind of rigid. Whereas when I animate, I want them to be naturally animated. It looks real. And okay, it could look like the guy's leaning at a bar with a pint of beer in his hand, if that's what it is, and he's leaning on a gate. I want that similar kind of relaxation as if he is in the pub. This is the kind of the pose here, this really kind of just le uh, leaning him back. It's almost like a childlike kind of uh, little girl uh, leaning, waiting for a best mate to come out of school. It's that kind of animation that can really relax things down and get away from this word posing. Um, here, though, this is what I refer to as a pose. It's fixed, the hand is on the hip, the flowers are out on towards the side, there's all, everything being controlled in that. And even though I've kind of controlled this element here, just that natural lean, the pushing away of the hips, the different kind of styling of the expression and kind of leaning away with the head will totally change it from a posed image to a naturally animated image. And something that takes a little bit of a while to perfect, but when you get it, you can kind of flow through images without any trouble with animation. Inside, outside, what do I mean by that? Well, the first thing is she's inside of the pillar. So it's basically inside of the, door, of the doorway. So we get that feather technique of the light. And then when we step her out in towards the light, we get a totally different contrast, which is absolutely key as well. At this point, the, the, the kind of the weather is drying up a little bit. Um, again, we've got a mixture between kind of clouds coming in and out now, of course. But we've still got an increase of exposure there from here to outside around about a stop to a stop and a half and that's absolutely imperative to know I always meet her with a meter not through in camera why because I'd have to find something within the scene here that is a neutral kind of 18% kind of color balanced gray a gray tone whereas I use a, me a meter I hold it by her face here I take the meter read in I pretty much fix my aperture so I like to work at f2.8 or f4 uh, at this kind of location on this kind of day probably I'm at 200 ISO or 400 ISO and all I need to do then is when I meet her here, the only thing that's going to change is my shutter speed. So I just go to the camera, I change my shutter speed, and I'm shooting. She walks outside, I do the same thing, I meet her from the face, or if my face is in similar light, I meet her from my face towards the light source, and then once more, all I need to do is change that shutter speed. And it's a quick way to work with the inside-outside idea with it. 
This is the outside in, inside, uh, again, but we're working in kind of reverse. We've got quite a lot of strong light coming in from the back. You can see here, from the shadow being cast by the pillars, uh, the light is coming in from reverse. So that's why we've got this strength of light coming down the side. But I'm using a reflector in that to bounce some of the light back. Without bouncing some of that light, light back and taking the exposure from the face here, I, I would end up with either of one of two things. I would either uh, end up with a very dark face if I measured for the light side here, or if I measured for the dark side of the face, I would get blown out and bleached out, and obviously that would be unusable fully. Um, as I'm doing here, I'm adding the reflector in to help me kind of control the contrast within the scene. That's the key thing with it. And this image, all I've done is walked uh, around about 20, uh, 25 feet uh, away from this location. So uh, I'm more in towards the shade and I'm not allowing any of that harsh sunlight to kind of start to touch on towards her at all. In fact, it looks like the cloud has gone in a little bit, but the key, the key thing is here, you'll get two different types of light, one with the sunlight and one against the light. I suppose these two images really do demonstrate the choice of lens being correct. I mean, there's a couple of things that I've not spotted before until now. There's two bins in the background, um, but they're, hard, they're hardly visible because of the lens choice. Because I've used uh, still a long lens and I'm using the f2.8, um, I'm dropping out most of the background quite quick, uh, quickly, uh, even though it's a full length plus more. Um, whereas as soon as I kind of zoom in towards the image, uh, obviously, we take out those distractions here, but we also start to kind of make use of this phenomenal blue tone of color that starts to really be a visual element to the photograph with it, a real complement to the whole scene. The light just coming through this pillar now just gives us that accent, that beautiful three-dimensional three edge to her as well, and it just allows us to get graphically uh, kind of real shape and Im impact here and even though this image is good I'd obviously had to go in to retouch out those it wouldn't take very long but I'd need to actually see those before they go into the bride's album of course um, but the key thing here is the lens choice don't just choose for a basic lazy lens like the likes of a 24 to 105 or a 28 to 70 because all they're ever going to do is give you a wide angle most of the time discipline yourself into you uh, using the lens at its maximum or racked out and you're going to be able to kind of get a different style of photograph right in the next wedding that you do. And then if you do have the chance to use a much longer lens with a wide aperture, the likes of 28 f4, then you can really kind of make your background pop away from the, sub the subject. We talked about the twist before in exactly the same way. Uh, we're shooting the back of the dress shot. Let's not forget the twist around just adds that extra little element and variety in towards the shot. Then we can add in a secondary interest in the background, like, like the groom, a slight camera position change, just bringing him in now will just give this lovely three dimension, this kind of difference in, in the background. That's what we're trying to create the whole time with it. But the walking and the talking with it, when uh, I'm getting um, the grooms to walk towards their brides in real life, as it were, instead of model bride and groom here, um, I get the groom to actually talk, talk to her and shout, and shout to her things as a little bit of a laugh. Uh, and kind of, uh, it's really kind of quite, quite funny at times. Uh, I'm not sure if we've ever, ever record, uh, recorded it on one of our weddings on Photo Training For You, but uh, some of the things that the grooms say to the brides, we could never actually show anyway, because it can get quite filthy at times, to be honest, but it's a bit of fun. Um, but again, this walk and the talk and kind of think about what he's doing. Is he looking away as he's walking? Uh, I don't really want him looking just at me at all. I want him looking at her. She's the focal point, not me. I'm just an observer of the day. I'm taking the images, but this is about these two pe people and not about me and them. We talked about the dip and the animation before uh, and as I said, said to you uh, the natural animation I'm using his arm now um, on the pillar okay in competition and qualifications this is a little thing here that we would kind of criticize it on because it is a distraction this kind of almost a stump arm going in towards the pillar um, but I'm using it to uh, allow him to really take control of her gets great expression that's going on in here in the same way I could use that hand onto this part of her waist to take her in the control so the pillar wasn't there uh, but as it was I kind of liked all this kind of solidness this blueness and kind of the, they had a great kind of, they'd never met before this day in fact so we've got a great animation going on within this couple the groom uh, again let's not forget him <laughs> I'm a, fa a father of two two sons I will um, have two um, daughter daughter-in-laws of course um, but I want as much effort paid to my sons on their wedding day I promise you uh, that I do to just the, uh, the bride and so many photographers 
forget that. They forget it's, it's a marriage of two people, uh, whether they're same-sex marriages or kind of uh, mixed couple. Um, it's down, it, there's two people and two sets of parents there, and we've really got to make sure we satisfy not only the bride's mum and dad and the groom's mum and dad, but also the bride. She wants a photograph of him. He's probably less likely to buy a photograph of her to go in his wallet than she is to buy a photograph of him to go in her purse. So why wouldn't you make all that effort in photographing the groom? And it takes five minutes of fun to actually get those variety. Uh, I talked about kind of splitting the face as well with it. Kind of, I, I like this kind of technique with it. Again, it's not the whole thing. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd obviously probably have some complaints. But uh, added in towards the variety, uh, we're going to see Carl, in fact, with uh, his other wife um, on a, a different film. And you'll see a different kind of twist on this, quite graphical twist as well. So watch out for that up one. But again, just thinking about the variety, thinking about the hands, hands in pockets, hands crossed, hands kind of leading. Uh, obviously those are the things we haven't got a bouquet to hide, uh, to hide behind leaning on towards the wall kind of hand behind, above the head lots of things that we can do with the groom and not just sticking his hands in his pockets um, when we kind of start to play around with our ideas uh, here I'm dragging the shutter a little bit and getting some kind of swish in towards the dress uh, be careful how many times you do it because I have been known to get a bride to kind of rip her dress a little bit if she gets a bit too animated so just a little bit of cautious um, but uh, just by dragging the shutter just a little bit so in other words a 15 30th sec uh, second I might have to use a bigger aperture that's why we can see of course all the detail beginning to come through in the background now um, but really what I want to do is static her so we know her feet and a torso and a head are very still. All I wanted to do is basically just swish the dress just a little bit. And as I say, three, just do it, bang. Three, bang, and back again. So I can kind of ridge it there, but don't forget the expression. That's absolutely key, because otherwise you can get a great swoosh and you've kind of got a dull bride, and that's the last thing you ever want in any photographs. We talked about the walking and the talking as far as kind of him talking to her, but also when I'm doing the together shots, we're just coming over a bridge. Um, we basically stopped for lunch and then we kind of continued on my workshop and uh, here uh, the sun has come out. We couldn't have wished for a better workshop day because we had a wet wedding scenario and we had, of course, the sunlight scenario. We all wish for that kind of thing. Um, but so just kind of one uh, a bridge that uh, is local and, and this is um, around about a, a five minute drive from the last location. So this is on the way to uh, pretty much any receptions as we left the last location. So this would be a natural second location stop off, even if it was just for the walk and talking images alone. Um, again, what I want to do is to make sure it's real. I often get down on the floor and I shoot from a low camera angle. Uh, why it seems to be a little bit better when you're shooting up. Uh, it just gives this natural kind of animation, especially if you're on a curved bridge. Um, but as well as the full length, uh, really what I'm concentrating on is them, this kind of natural animation. Be, care be careful a bride doesn't fall over her dress, especially if it's long. Just getting her to pick up the dress with one hand to allow her to make sure that she can walk fast or, t or kind of slow, uh, slow, slowly uh, or run at times uh, without kind of falling over, of course. You know, I want to make sure my brides are safe, of course, no matter what with it. And don't forget the reverse shot. I'll often do this shot twice, in fact. So as they kind of walk away, um, I'll just get to say, okay, guys, just have a little chat to each other as you're going away. Please separate just a little bit, uh, but looking towards each other, just have a bit of a chat. So there's my first shot. Then it would be coming over the bridge, which would be the full length shot, coming back towards me as they get closer and closer and closer, of course. Naturally, I'm going to get that kind of cut down shot images, but I want expression. I need them speaking to each other. I want them to have a little bit of laugh and so on. And then I'll get them to do it again. I'll just get a different kind of shot, kind of just going from there. And of course the run, but make, make sure that it's safe. Often I'll get the brides to remove their shoes um, in, if they're on kind of stilet uh, stilettos, so there's no da a danger going on there. We do get some grooms are a little bit over enthusiastic, as our model groom was for the day. Uh, but still, look at the expressions that they've got going on here. As I said, they hadn't met until a few hours before. So this is a real great way for us to be able to actually naturally bring what I would hope that we could actually get out of a real bride and groom on their wedding day with it. But the same thing applies again, one for the walk-in the walk and one for the run-in, so we can get that kind of variety. Back on the bridge for the static shots uh, before we move to the kind of the last location, which is, by the way, just going to be across that bridge. Uh, we'll get there in a minute. 
Um, but uh, as far as this shot is concerned, I talked about a shot of the groom, I talked about the shot of the bride. Well, if I set them up right, especially, especially on a perfect kind of location as we are here, uh, I've got the elements to do bride and groom, groom and bride without any real work. Just thinking again about color, the composition and the flow, of course. So uh, I can get that per the perfect one, two, three. I'll always want to get a full length, three quarter length and closer up shots. The best selling shots are always three, a three quarter, but I don't want to miss out on the full length because that is a natural double page spread. So I'm thinking already as how they would be perhaps in a wedding album. And if it was a double page spread, I could just inset then two or three images running in here as an, in, an inset, even kind of using one side here as a bit of an out of focus or a kind of subdued kind of color and things really. Exactly the same with the bride on the side here with it. A great way to one, two, three it. Um, and then just kind of wor working in the two uh, and just trying to bring that little bit of variety. I talked about the animation of the hands. I think these kind of variety uh, are a good exa example of hands. Um, grooms, as a rule of thumb, they don't want to do anything except go for a beer. Um, so I do try and kind of minimise what we do with a groom. Um, but when they kind of love, love themselves as much as he does, uh, kind of uh, I can bring a little bit more animation in towards the scene. But it's the bride's kind of bit of, bit of fun. The only one I haven't arranged here is this shot. She naturally went to that. Uh, and, and kind of you'll either love it you hate or you hate it don't work that too long because I was saying you might lose the expressions with it uh, instead just the hands in towards the tummy or the hands onto the shoulder the shoulder around the neck as we've done before uh, and then actually just coming into the leaning shots again um, I'm interested in her at this point that fashion-y styling that's really what I'm going for in this kind of variety of images um, but again from the kind of the leaning on and then the kind of the leaning away Two different styles of photograph, two different expressions, a slightly different camera angle as well, and all within kind of a minute of each other. Then with and without the sun, uh, as I said, this is, was a wet wedding day. The sun's come out, the clouds are there though. So we're ready for the sun to go in and out. Um, or we might be in a bit of a shaded location, the one minute, and then we step out in towards the sun. Uh, a quick tip if you're metering, uh, whether you're metering in camera or metering by hand like I, like I do, I always have in my head my shutter speed for shadow or shade, and I have a shutter speed for sunlight. And that is the only thing I need to do. So in other words, when I move from this image and I move her across the other side of the bridge, or let's say the sun happened to come out, um, then I need to know I move, move from, let's say, a 60th of a second here to 250th of a second. I don't have to worry about ISO change or the likes of the um, aperture change. And as soon as the sun is out and it's consistently out, I want to drop down the ISO as quick as I can. I like to work on the minimum ISO. Why? Um, because that, that will allow me to uh, kind of work at wider ap apertures and slower shutter speeds. And with the whole point of the slower shutter speeds as well, if I'm using flash, I'm not having to kind of cheat things with neutral densities and everything else with it to kind of really get the effect. So as far as when the sunlight comes out, the first thing I like to do, as I said, is drop the ISO down, still keep to my, F, my F2.8 or my F4 or lower. Uh, and then uh, what we do is actually just change the shutter speed. But when I'm using a long lens, I like to have at least 200 of a second uh, with a 7200 uh, 70, lens, if not faster, in fact, uh, kind of going upwards. That's just to avoid the shutter shake. Uh, when we start to work with a bit of shadow and shade, this is kind of a, again, it was this perfect workshop. That's why I wanted to kind of really uh, train through this, really. And uh, the, key, the key point is here, he is naturally just out of shade in this Im image, which give, gives me this perfect kind of almost silhouette against the light background, whereas she is being lit so solidly with that light, he's naturally going to go dark because the exposure, of course, is for her face. And then I allow him to move in a little bit, and then all of a sudden we just get that little bit of a touch of a light just going onto there, and it will dramatically change it. And kind of shooting through things, anything that is not being lit will make a good shoot through. Uh, a gate, if it's black, even if it's lit, can actually act like a good shoot, shoot through, as long as it doesn't look like uh, it's bars of a jail, of course, key point there. Uh, but just think about this three-dimensional um, split in the background and split in the focus, of course, uh, again, even with a three-quarter length or a full length of him and uh, with her, I can still create 
that split focus because I'm using that long lens and wide aperture once more. The exposure is pretty much the same. She's pretty much about 10 feet in front of him or he's 10 foot behind her, whichever way you want to say it. Uh, but the exposure is going to be the same um, so I can kind of drop in and out. The one minute I can have him in focus, the next minute I can have her in fo focus with it or I can move him up towards her and then obviously it kind of creates the same kind of variety. But the split focus technique here doesn't take a lot of work and I think you can accept that this looks like a real modern kind of uh, an animation to a couple. The sunglasses help, of course. I always try and encourage the couples to take along sunglasses, especially if it's a summer wedding. We're expecting sunlight as well, as well as all the best men and, and ushers and so on with it. You know what? Um, I'm glad cyclists are allowed to shoot where I, you know, ride where I shoot, um, because they just add that extra little bit of a fun element to the photograph. Uh, you, you might think, no, I'm not going to photograph it, but this is a great image. The expression is natural with it. This is the shot I've posed her up for or animated her for um, to give this natural kind of lean back and looking in towards the sun. Um, but again, when you kind of see some cyclists coming through, all I'm, lo I'm looking for is those holes. So kind of pace, uh, pacing it through. And sometimes, yes, we missed it, but it's worth the effort to try and get those photographs. There's no cost involved with digital. Year, years ago, it used to cost us a lot with film. Uh, but nowadays, of course, we can just basically basically get away without um, having to kind of uh, worry about what, uh, what we're photographing. For me, strips of sunlight is what I run towards, and for many of you, you're probably running away from them. Uh, why? Well, I just think they add that studio type of fashion photography, and uh, for the past 30 odd years, uh, okay, I was a young man, you know, I shot my first wedding at 15. Um, we began to do it professionally at 18 while I worked for another photographer, a commercial photographer. And uh, we were shoot shooting, by the time we opened our studio at the age of 21, um, I was already shooting 30 weddings a year, and that built up to over 100 weddings a year with uh, uh, my other photographers and things, really. So we're talking business here, yeah? Um, but really, it hasn't changed that much as far as the photography is concerned. Um, you do your classics, but then you do your something different. Unless you bring your something different to the, ta the table, you're just another photographer. And okay, perhaps I don't stand out as much today as once upon a time. However, if I was running the wedding business like I used to year years ago, I would be full on to really developing my thing, being different the whole time, but still make, making sure that my bride and groom are the most important part. It's not about my photography, it's about their wedding day. So this would just be a part of the variety, okay? And I'm not going to spend 20 minutes doing this and five minutes doing the, ba the basics because they might hate all this stuff and think, hang on a minute, you spent all that time doing that. So it is this kind of balancing act. This is about a, a two to a three minute se a series in here, just in case. And remember, the, the, the more different I can make images, the more images you're going to sell, okay? If everything is the same, everything's the same. And that's one of the problems that so many photographers fall into the trap with. They go, oh yeah, they really like the photographs, yeah, you know, and they did this. And, uh, but they're not really buying extras, and that's the, kind of the key thing. You've got to make every image count. So the strips of sun, I absolutely love what I was saying. And, and this, as I said, it was just that perfect end to a, a great work, workshop day. And I'm not saying that each of my workshops uh, isn't a perfect day, but it would be great if I could have rain in the morning, sun in the afternoon. We'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd never have any ulcers ever again, I promise you, about the weather worrying on workshops. Anyway, exposure's the same. So she's metered for the same as him. The sun's all the way up there. It's the same slot. It's just in a different place with it. And unless it was being feathered, you can see the kind of the tran transition from the, the kind of the face across here, as you can here. Um, but they are exactly the same exposure because I'm using the hot part of the light. The difficulty would be if I was trying to use the kind of the feather edge of that light with it, and we just get a little bit more diff difficult. But look at the kind of, and remember, these are the images straight out of, ca of camera here. We haven't done anything to, to, to them. You'll have to watch the other film of actually how we kind of really kind of finish these uh, in variety to kind of really make them special and stand out from the crowd as well with it. So that exposure, I've kind of talked about it quite a lot today, but that's a kind of key element. And if you're using your exposure in camera, you're pretty much going to get stuffed. You're going to have to do at least two or three test shots to make sure you've got the expo exposure, where basically I go up there and I meet it on her face with the sunlight with my, me my meter. That gives me my exposure. I transfer that onto the camera 
and basically I'm shooting straight away with it. Uh, again, with no editing or very little editing then or correction in the likes of uh, Adobe Camera Raw because I do shoot a raw file, of course. Uh, but again, just keeping that exposure right, as long as she maintains, she's my main image here, as you, you can see, but as long as she maintains that position, the cloud doesn't come out, whatever it would be, then I've got the same exposure running throughout all of those images. Don't be scared of the sun. That's my message to you. <laughs> because at the beginning of this, we were frightened of the rain and we had to kind of really work the classics because there wasn't the kind of the true strength of light and so on. I didn't want to get going with flash straight, straight away because I like to use flash with the bride and groom in a dramatic way and not kind of just illuminate things. There's a big difference between illumination and light and lighting, of course. And, you know, sp speaking about that, what I believe, if we just go back for a minute, this is lighting, okay? Even though it's God's lighting, um, this is light, it's lighting. I've made the decision to use dramatic lighting, whereas on this image here, this is more kind of, it's a little bit more illumination. There's a little less energy to it, but still, if I could just encourage you just a little bit to use that light, but where possible, just don't get them to look at you. I can get away with the groom looking towards me here. I've hard lit him just to the side, so it's a 90 degree split, split light. He's got sunglasses on as well, so it's gonna hide all that kind of problem within the eyes. Um, but otherwise, we're gonna have a, a kind of a real dark face, and you're not gonna be able to sell that at all with it. Just think about how you use that sudden light to kiss them. That's the key point. Allow the light to flood. When you animate them, think about how you can kind of change it up a bit. Don't, don't just settle for a basic pose. And in fact, how this happened was one of the delegates asked about the, the kind of the posing element to it. And that's the great thing. If you ever get a chance to come on a workshop as well, um, the, the, great, the great thing is your interaction with me. And the great thing about interaction, of course, it kind of takes uh, a, a kind of a variety of photographs that I was going to do down to a different direction because you're asking things as we're going through. But again, just think about those positions, making sure the main part of the body and specifically the face is being kissed by that intensity of light to make sure you've got a usable exposure. Play with shadows, bit of fun. Again, it could be in studio, it could be a door, o door open here, couldn't it? Uh, and all it is, we're into the kind of the subtracted area from above, very hard shaft uh, strip of sunlight coming in here and again we were playing with uh, with the shadows and I was kind of trying to make it out to be the likes of um, the big director I've forgotten his name Sam was was Hitchcock that was it thanks Sam Sam's the video guy here and uh, they kind of get my Hitchcock kind of idea with it now the only thing I was worried about is the shape coming through here not sure what it was it almost looked like a second face but it also looked something quite rude so be careful when you're using shadows that you might not see it but there's subliminal messages working around the images and things here but uh, uh, again a great location use the location have a bit of fun with it. Yes, she stood up on the, the seating area there. She's hanging onto the fence. It's not 50 shades of gray. It's 50 shades of sunlight, really. It's kind of just getting that little bit of play, a little bit of fun, and just kind of imagination, just allow yourself to go, especially if you've got a cool cu couple who are willing to have a go, as it were. Um, if you've got a kind of a, a, an old couple like me and my wife, then obviously we're gonna be able to do a lot less, as it were. Um, but again, when you've got a young couple like you are here, milk it <laughs> do as much as you can for as long as you can but just keep that watchful eye on time and then just to kind of finish off with I wanted to include just a little bit of the off-camera flash stuff um, it would be something that I would do more towards the end of a wedding day or unless I've got an assistant out with me on the day um, why because um, often uh, I'm looking to kind of lower the ambient light within a scene what I'm doing here in fact uh, I'm kind of using an aperture uh, so all this lot, as you can see, is silhouetted um, because there's no light or very little light getting to it, whereas obviously the kind of the blue kind of skies and fluffy white clouds are all in the background. But I need to drop that um, ambient light down by a stop at least. And when I'm working out in sudden light, as we are here, probably we're looking at around about f11, f16 to get a workable shutter speed to allow, allow myself to still kind of photograph um, so we don't get any problem with uh, shutter so here what I've got is an ambient light that is at least one stop less than the key light itself. I've got two flashes going off the majority of the time, one to the right hand side which is just situated 
just on this wing of the, uh, the roof here, and the other one is being held by a, a, a delegate just actually off towards the side. Uh, I'd use a best man for that, I'd use a dad or kind of an assistant on the wedding day and things really. Um, but just uh, I even these out, in fact, I'd I usually have the key, key light one stop more than the, uh, the backlight, but because I knew I was going to twist him around, kind of get him to look towards the light as well, I need them to kind of balance up so I'm not going to have a difference in expo exposure. Um, but whatever you do, whatever location you choose, when you are trying to be more dramatic with your photographs, please, 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 please think about the safety of the bride and groom before you do anything else, because she's up on a 15-foot wall there, and I wouldn't uh, kind of put my bride on it on a day. Um, again, I don't mind getting dramatic with my bride and grooms on our location, location kind of shoots following their wedding days. I don't mind them kind of running in the sea and getting all wet and everything else, but on a wedding day, I want my bride to be the princess, and she's perfect, so I don't want to get mucky. I want her to go into that room of the reception where everybody is going, wow, you look amazing, and not, wow, what happened to your dress? Okay, that's the key thing with it as well with it. Two flashes is always going to be better than one. It's more effort, I know, but it will add that extra separation, of course, and that's what we've got going off here. And uh, that flash has just come in out of shot there, so it would usually be just hidden around the, cor the corner. That's why I use a radio trigger instead of flash-to-flash -flash communication, um, so that I can hide things around cor uh, corners and so on. Um, but I like the shadows. You can start, you start to see now, even though we've got the same exposure outside, the cloud has come in more, um, so it's lowered the ambient light even more here, um, but because I'm using the kind of the flash, I'm now looking up into a dark area in the sh shaded part of the, bil the building, it instantly starts to look a little bit more kind of a nighttime kind of styling of the photograph with it. But again, when we're using flash, I often like to use a very wide angle lens. My 12 to 24 sig Sigma lens is a great lens for kind of just having in the bag in case. Um, but it just kind of gives us this sweeping kind of environment. But I also like to do the kind of the closer up shots to so just not get carried away with that. But the key thing is keep it safe. That's absolutely essential, no matter what kind of photography that you're doing for the bride and groom for you. So I mean safe with the bride and groom, keep it safe with their po uh, the posing so it looks real. Keep it safe in exposure. Take control. Don't let the camera thing for you. Otherwise, some of the photographs that we just saw here, specifically the sun stripes and so on, you couldn't get away on program mode or aperture priority because it would be thinking for itself and overexposing that image, trying to give a, an average throughout the whole scene with it. Be safe, but be daring at the same, same time. Just don't keep to the same kind of animation, the same posing that you're doing, the same choice of locations that you're doing all the time. Think about what is really good for you as a photographer and what is better for your bride and grooms. And then at the end of day, all we need to do is make sure that we kind of follow these tech techniques of making sure we lower the ambient light as much as we can to create that images with a little bit more dra drama, especially when we start to work post the ceremony. So in other words, they've had their wedding, they've had their meal, it's probably beginning to get a bit dusky outside. That's a perfect timing for me if I'm staying on for the, spe the speeches to invite the couple back out to do some kind of cool shots with some flash and things really. But remember, remember adding flash into the mix will always add that bit of a kind of a extra headache for you if you're not experienced with it. So I hope you've enjoyed this film. We've just kind of done a lot. I know it's based on the workshops and those little video clips will give you a really good idea on kind of how it really works in real life. But the key, the key thing is what you cannot do on a real wedding day is everything that we've achieved there. But if we can achieve just 25%, then we're we're going to get much better photographs than we did the day before. So I'm Mark Cleghorn. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.